I should be writing season 20, episode 8. Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers, and I'm your host, Mer Lafferty. I've been doing this podcast for almost 20 years. In that time, I've written eight books and gotten several award nominations. I still find it awkward to produce my credentials at the beginning, but I there are so many people out there offering writing advice who aren't writers, so I try to give my credentials to start out with. It's not bragging. It's very awkward for me, which is why I mention it. I'm just saying I'm qualified to do this podcast, partly because of my experience and also because I am a mass of insecurities inside, which we'll get to later. But we talk about, we start the show by talking about what I've been up to because the show is called I Should Be Writing and I can't really push you guys to write if I'm not doing it. So I... I had an interesting week last week. I can't remember how much I told you guys since I didn't stream. Probably nothing. Um, As I mentioned, I've been working on getting my agent some parts of novels that he can sell. And I sent him one that he said, yeah, I think I can sell this. Yeah, tweak this and that. And so I tweaked this and that, and then I sent it back into him. And then the next day I woke up and... I had the novel like fleshed out in my head, beginning, middle, and end, major characters. It were they were all there. And I wrote him back and said, okay, this is not what I normally do. But here's an alternative outline. And I just wrote down everything I was thinking. And then I thought I heard from him over, I guess Friday or Saturday basically saying, yeah, this is better. You seem more excited about it. Let's go. So I haven't written on that yet, but I have, I, my goal is to take those uh, several thousand words and tweak them because the beginning can pretty much start the same way, even if the story is going to be going in a slightly different direction. Anyway, I got stuff done. And now I have to edit those and get them back to him. And that's on my plate for, I guess, this weekend. And then this week, I actually had a great trip, came home. My husband was out, so I took a taxi from the airport to home and left my phone in the taxi and didn't get it back until the next day. And I was so worried about it that I wiped it remotely so nobody could break break in and use it. I did not know that all of my backups from this phone, all of them, were corrupt or corrupted regardless it's uh i finally found a non-corrupted backup from 2022 so i have lost all my photos all my fitness i've been doing apple fitness plus for almost a year now and was pretty proud of my how far i'd gotten and uh yeah that's gone Contacts are gone, but those are a little bit easier because it's not all my contacts. So I can try to think of, essentially, if I answer you, new phone, who dis? I'm serious. And so that anxiety and realization has eaten up a lot of this week. This morning I got up and I got ready to do my workout. And I was thinking, I got I to gotta get my morning routine going. I kind of have a morning routine, but it's pretty flimsy. And I thought, I remember seeing a coach that I've worked with do a Patreon video about the importance of a morning routine, especially for creatives. I, I watched it and I thought, I need. I think I need to watch Josh's other videos with Patreon. And then I thought, maybe I just need to call Josh and say I want a session. And then I thought, I, I just had the, this epiphany. I tell you guys, I tell everybody listening, a lot of people want the magic bullet. They want the magic bullet of what will make them a writer, what will get them published. What switch can they flip to make them write a thousand words a day? And I'm like, there is none. And the answer is just to write and and keep writing. 
And, you know, pay attention to things, pick up a craft book now and then, get critiqued. But really, it's just writing. And then I realized I was a hypocrite because I kept looking at all the advice Josh and other people are giving out and discounting it and thinking, no, I'll just wait till you tell me something I want to hear. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed, but you guys know when I embarrass myself, I usually, uh, <laughs> I usually air it on the podcast and try to work through it. Some advice doesn't work. I've said it before, Ray Bradbury's Zen and the Art of Writing really messed me up. A lot. That advice pushed me in the wrong direction entirely. And, you know, some people say, write every day, and some people say, I write 10,000 words on the weekends. You have to find the thing that really does work for you. But when you do, you probably know it, even if you don't like it. And for me, it's a stable morning routine is what I need. Prima Muhammad can help people become a writer for a very reasonable fee. She will come over to your house and hit you with a broom if you do not write. Prima Muhammad, everybody. Look her up. Yes, my wife tells me she can she can tell when I'm stuck on a story or novel because the kitchen gets very clean. Exactly. I was thinking about the movie Stranger Than Fiction, which is a really interesting movie on a couple of levels, but... One thing that just makes me really annoyed is they show the Will Ferrell character as being stuck in his ways of, of getting up at the same time every morning and brushing his teeth exactly the same way and eating the same food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you look at it from the point of view of someone with ADHD, that's heaven. That's like, because neurotypical people are just like, well, you know, you don't need to make plans to brush your teeth, do you? I'm like, yes, yes, I do. I have to put brush teeth and shower on my to-do list. Eventually, if, if I don't do that, it might be like three, four, five o'clock before I do it. And so the fact that they took this man with this routine that worked for him, broke him up and made him get a guitar and date Zoe Deschanel. I'm like, but you're telling people that routines are bad and you won't date Zoe Deschanel if you have one. And knowing the people who've made routines work for them is... Something I try to remember. I think they've done studies that the people who order the same thing at the restaurant whenever they go, they're happier because they find the thing they want. They can be, you know, adventurous and try something new. But when they study the happiness level at the end of the meal, if you find your favorite thing, stick with it. You don't hurt anybody. Routines are good, especially for neurodiverse people. And my only routine right now is I work out at 8 o'clock every morning because I've got a buddy that I meet on a call and we work out together. My plan was to get something done between 7 and 8, and that is the thing I struggle with. But I'm not going to find the answer in another video. I'm not going to find the answer in another book. I think there's a s another productivity book on my sh porch right now that I have to go get. This feels related. I'm not even sure if it is, but I've been thinking about seeing as how it's the 20th season. I've been, you know, taking stock and seeing where I've wanted to go different places with the show, where I've failed, where maybe I need to mix things up. And one of the things always is prepare better. I even made a long list of things I need to do before I stream. Or before I record. And then I'll lose it and make another one. Have I ever followed any of these checklists? No. And I think today I figured out why. Sometimes creative people are afraid to create. Uh, most of the time, actually. Or at least me. You know when you're, you're getting on the, the high dive at the pool. And they're like, don't think about it, just go. And the longer you sit up there and you're frozen, the scarier it gets. That's been me podcasting for 20 years. If I start to think about what I'm going to do, what my topic is, if I do all my stream prep correctly, if I make sure I go look at Publishers Weekly and File 770 beforehand, if I make sure the bot is doing all the neat things that the bot can do, I think I'll talk myself out of it. Or maybe it's just the fact that I don't want to do those things and therefore I'll pile that on to not wanting to stream. 
or record. It's, it's really hard. Well, I mean, I guess it's good that I came up with that. But, you know, realizing why you're avoiding something doesn't necessarily make it easier to not avoid. But I think about early on in streaming, I tried to make my skin look a little better on camera. Tried makeup and stuff. And it was kind of fun. And, you know, it was pandemic. We were all doing weird stuff. But now I think I have to put on makeup and make myself look good for the stream. And then I think I don't want to put on makeup. And then I don't stream. Whereas if I'm like, put on a clean shirt, it's time to stream. Let's go. I'll do it. I think this is also the the uh, the downside of being alone on this project. I don't have a producer saying, okay, do X, Y, and Z, and then we'll stream. It's just me at the top of the diving board going, I just got to run and jump. Which has worked for me, except for the fact that I've been doing this 20 years. And you'd think I would not be afraid at the top of the diving board. You'd think that, wouldn't you? I think all this prep just gives me time to talk myself out of it. Streaming and recording has always been difficult for me in that realm of, does anybody really care what I have to say? And no, it has nothing to do with you guys because you guys support me. Those of you com who come to the live show support me. Those of you who hang out in the Discord support me. Those of you who download and listen and never contact me at all, I know you're supporting me. Or else you just haven't checked your podcast catcher in a long time, and I'm still getting downloads, so that's cool too. For me, the question, does anybody care about this, looms large. And I think this is why interviews stress me out. Because I'm not alone at the top of the diving board and somebody new to my show is probably not going to appreciate me grabbing their hand and going, come on, let's jump. So I have to be an adult and prep. One of the best parts of ADHD is learning you have ADHD is learning that the weird shit you've done, <laughs> I swore on the podcast, the weird shit you've done in your life was not because you were lazy or stupid or just not living up to your potential but because your brain fires in different ways than other people. The downside to learning you have it is that that's the way your brain works. You could put things in place to help you deal with it. For example, like we said, the routine. Valerie, the kids are asleep, said that she put, once she realized that, like, she rearranged her house to put everything she needed where it needed to be so that it would be obvious for people to go there and get it. I don't think I'm ever going to lose that feeling of being afraid to prep because I'll talk myself out of it and then running and jumping off the high dive. I, I mean, I think it's I think it's good that I'm able to talk <laughs> into a microphone for a long time without too much planning, but I've been talking about where I wanted to take the stream or whining that I haven't leveled up, really. That could be a reason. But what to do about it, I don't know, because it sure as heck isn't making lists, because I've been doing that. So many blank books, so many lists. So that's what's been on my mind. And I think that's also why I haven't been streaming many games, especially the games I've been talking about, such as Lighthouse at the End of the World, because these these solo RPGs, I've really been wanting to to play them, but... That requires a new level of prep, which starts with this whole setup that you can't see. So getting the the desk mounted camera in the right spot or the top down camera at the right spot and then making sure that my desk is clean because my desk isn't clean. So I can't, I could not start the game right now. The Kids Are Asleep says there's a difference between being able to find the sugar for your coffee and finding the emotional energy for podcasting. Yeah. So you're not you're not saying I can just put something in the right spot and then it'll all get better? Please? So next week, I'm going on the Joko Cruise, which I'm still baffled that I was invited. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, be the captain of my ads. Thank you, Spice Scribe. Good to see you. Um, and because my family's unable to go with me, I'll be taking Ursula Vernon as my plus one. And so we should have fun. 
I know I'm doing readings, signings, live I should be writings. I'm running at least one Brindlewood Bay game, maybe two. I have to decide which adventure to run. Brindlewood Bay adventures are very open-ended. They just give you a place to start. But the adventures are so interesting. There's one that's very clearly a, you know, a copy of the Great British Baking Show. Even down to the description of the people who are on the show. And I've run that one a couple of times, and it's always fun. At FenCon, I wrote, I, I ran the first one, the first one they put out, which is Dad Overboard, where a millionaire falls off a yacht, and you have to talk to the family to figure out who did it, or the butler, or the captain. The challenge of Brindlewood Bay, and I don't know if uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, which is what it's based on, uh, I don't know if this is standard throughout, but with Brenda Wood Bay, you've got little old ladies solving crimes. The game master, or the keeper, as they call it, does not know who did it. It's only their job to put voices in the NPC's uh, mouths that sound interesting or different and drop clues. And then your players take all the clues they've found and then come up with a, uh, a reasonable solve. And then they roll dice. So that gives you a lot of space to create, which is sometimes scary. No, no real whodunit at all. No one knows. It's, it's whether the people can take everything they've found. And some of the clues are pretty obscure. Considering no one had played Brindlewood Bay before, I did not give them the clue a cod with a rat stuffed in its mouth. Maybe I should have. Maybe they would have run with it. I don't know. But then they say, okay, we think this person did this because of X, Y, and Z. And then they roll. And if they roll high, they get it right. And if they roll low, something happens. So it's one of those things where the players have a lot of agency. Which, of course, if you have seen me running Brindlewood Bay for um, Ursula Vernon, Gwenda Bond, uh, Joey T. Badger, and my kid... You'll know it, it, the chaos gremlins can have a lot of fun with it. And Ursula is a chaos gremlin. Ursula had us running to the medical examiner in the middle of the night to demand answers about this dead body she found. And then I had the medical examiner's wife leave him. And then someone else, I think maybe Gwenda, took her into the van with the dead body in the back and gave her counseling. And the woman went back to her husband. This, none of this is even hinted at in the adventure. So you got to run with it. But on the other hand, it gives the players a lot of agency, which is, uh, yeah. Find me at mightymur at gmail.com or mervers.com. I'm on Twitch at mightymur. I'm on Blue Sky mightymur, TikTok mightymur. And Instagram, Mighty Mer numeral two. Yeah, I know. So if you want to find me, that's where I'll be online. Or you can just subscribe to the podcast. And I'll see you next time because you should be writing. Thank you for listening to I Should Be Writing, the longest running writing podcast in existence. This episode was made possible by the fabulous who support the podcast via Patreon or Substack. Join the fabulous at patreon.com slash mightymer or mightymer.substack.com. Theme music provided by John Anilio. Art provided by Numbers Ninja. And podcast hosting provided by Libsyn. This episode is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 License. You can find all of my books and podcasts at merverse.com. <laughs>